for a few weeks, so yeah, it's really nice. But I'll say no more, um, and we'll just get straight into to worshiping our Saviour. Um, and uh, let's pray. Good and gracious Father, we just thank you for another Sunday where we can come together and worship you. We thank you that restrictions are lifting a little and some of us can actually be together and I hope that everyone, if they're willing, will get to experience that in that community again. But for now, we just thank you that we can still, as a family, meet together and worship you. In this changing climate and uncertainty, we don't know what's happening or if things will get better soon or, or change for the worse, we don't know. But what we do know, God, is we're coming to worship you today, an unchanging God, a good and gracious God. who was the same yesterday, today, and will be forever. So let's sing to him this morning, and we're going to open with Glorious Day. Well, good morning. Uh, we certainly extracted every bit of juice out of that song, didn't we? <laughs> uh, nice to see you. Uh, I can see all your faces in front of me on the TV screen, and we can see a few people in the building today. Uh, so nice to, uh, to see you. Welcome, folks um, from Scotland. And I can see a few pictures on the screen of people not in, from Scotland. So welcome to you too. You know who you are, and it's great to, to have you here. So um, this is just the, the third week that we've come back into the building. Uh, so we're kind of getting used to it as well. I'm kind of looking at a camera at the back. I'm looking at a TV screen monitor in the front. I'm looking at people around me here. So uh, welcome to, to our church today. Um, we really do want to encourage you to, to register and to come. Um, you know, we can get, um, we estimate up to maybe 35, maybe up to 40 in this building. Um, we know that you have to do it when you feel ready to do that, but we want to encourage you to do it um, so that we can actually meet together and, and fellowship. Now, I know that all depends on the, the, the restrictions and the announcements that are going to be made, so we have to watch our TV screens carefully to hear that. I um, want to encourage you, though, to, to do that. Um, and uh, so we can join together and worship. Uh, we are not having a prayer time this week. We're having it every two weeks. So we, we met this past week. So in two weeks' time, we'll do another one of our, our midweek prayer gatherings using the revival stories. And we hope that you've been inspired by these. We want to encourage you to join us on a Wednesday night every two weeks, whether you normally join us for prayer meetings or not. They're really inspiring videos to watch. Um, of different stories of how God has worked in the past, and then we spend time praying together. Um, Breakout, our children's club, meets on Tuesday night, again through Zoom. They were going to do Zoom through September and then make a decision if they were going to convene again uh, with others. So um, I'm not sure if they're going to do that yet, but Tuesday night, half past 6, 6.45, 6.45 Tuesday night, uh, the kids will meet together um, like on Zoom. Um, we do, uh, we are continuing to meet in our food bank and our care and share. So for the last three weeks, um, we opened up the cafe again and we started serving people. Interestingly, the numbers of people who have been coming has dropped. Uh, we thought that we were going to get a, a, a spike, like a, a greater number of people coming. Uh, that's not been the case. So that's fine. We've had manageable numbers who come on a Thursday um, maybe somewhere around 15 or so people uh, have come each week and we're able to serve them in the basement uh, at our food bank and, and our care and share. We do still need help though picking up food. Um, there's really just one person doing that at the moment on a Monday. So we do need someone who's free on either a Wednesday, Thursday or Friday, one of those days to pick up food from Morrison's if you can, please. So if you're watching online, you live in Glasgow and you can do that even once in a while, please let us know. We, we do need help uh, to be able to do that. Um, so I don't have any other things to share. I'm just going to uh, just pray now. And again, um, welcome and, and thank you all for joining us today. Um, I want to thank Nicole um, for coming up uh, from air and we're leading us today. She's a bit disappointed though. She was hoping to be able to sing, but as you can see, we still haven't got our big screen, which is ordered. Um, 
John has been in touch with the Chinese government directly to make sure that it is on the way. Um, and so uh, he has gotten assurance from the president of China that it will be here very soon. And when it's here, Nicole Cameron will be able to sing again because we want to hear her sing, uh, even though it's behind the screen. So keep praying, pray that that screen will arrive. Oh, sorry, there was one other thing. Uh, thank you all personally for praying for Phil, our son Phil. Uh, Phil had an interview for a job about um, a week and a half ago, and this week he got the great news, the exciting news, that he got the job. So uh, uh, thank you for praying. Phil is here today. He's like literally right at my feet. Um, you can't see him, but I can see him. Um, and he's really excited by that. So um, he'll be starting a new job very soon. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Though it feels strange that we can need to gather this way um, in the building and with our friends online, we thank you that wherever we are, your spirit is here with us. I uh, thank you for new friends who come to join us this morning, both here in the building and online. Pray that you will bless them and encourage them, have a word for them, um, uh, whatever their need, wherever they are in their lives. Um, and God, we do just pray, we lift up this whole situation to you in, in our country, in our, in our city here of Glasgow and the surrounding um, districts. We pray, God, that you will just have mercy upon us, that you will eradicate um, this terrible um, virus that is afflicting us and uh, people all around the world. Um, God, in times of plague in the past, people have turned to you, uh, confessed to you, have called upon your name, have asked for your mercy to come. And you've done that in the past. And Lord, we're in another one of those times where we need you uh, and we do call out to you. Lord, many times it takes terrible situations to happen before people ultimately call out and cry out to God. Uh, and we see that even in the Bible, at times when people suffered, then they called out to you. So, Lord, we're calling out to you. We need you. We need your help. We need your mercy. Um, we need you, Lord, to just work in our land. And, uh, and so, God, we just pray today on behalf of our whole country and our world, we lift them up to you and pray that you will just intervene. Uh, just bless everyone, Lord, those at home, those who are here. Uh, thank you for answering some of our prayers this week. We're really excited by that. Uh, and we just continue to come before you and thank you that you love us and that you are going to bring us through this time. Uh, we give the, your thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks very much, Don. And just to touch on as well what Don said. So if you, there's safe measures in place. So if you do feel like it's safe enough for you to come, you want to come, then I encourage you to register because it's really nice to be here together. It's not the same, um, but our God is still the same and it's really nice to be here and worship uh, with, our, with our family. So if you feel like it, uh, it's safe for you, then do certainly register and come along. Um, I'm going to pass over to the lovely Lindsay now, who's going to talk to our wee ones. Oh, no. <laughs> I guess not. So she's going to come and talk to you. We, oh, my goodness. Look at that. <laughs> Looking suave hen. <laughs> uh, she's going to come talk to you once, and then we'll go straight into a song uh, for you as well. So thanks, Lindsay. Good morning, everyone. How are we all? I wonder if you might indulge me for a wee moment, and I can say a big hi to Em. Um, this is our first Sunday not doing Zoom together in the same house. Um, so I'm thinking about all the students. Um, back away from their families and just all the worries and concerns around about COVID and things. So um, big shout out and lots of love and hugs and, and prayers um, to keep you safe while you're out there. Now I'm wondering if some of you are thinking, why is Lindsay wearing a pair of sunglasses indoors and actually in a day that's not very sunny? Well, I'm going to tell you why. Because actually these sunglasses have helped me to understand and be able to tell you the story and share the message for today. And 
actually, it happened just yesterday. I was kind of struggling to come up with how to share this with you. And um, actually, popping on a pair of sunglasses helped me. So I'll tell you what happened. Yesterday, I had to take Daniel to a rugby um, team match. Um, because of COVID, they can't play other schools, but they can have um, team matches with um, their own team. Um, because they're all safely in their own school bubble. Um, so we hopped into the car and we headed over and they have a very clever shirt at Daniel's school because they were having to split one team into two teams so that us watching and the coaches um, and obviously the team players themselves knew who was in which team. They have a very clever shirt and the shirt is super clever because they can wear it two different ways. So they can wear it this way so this team are the blue and red team. And then as if by magic, you can turn it inside out and you're in the blue and black team. So we arrived and Daniel got into the right side of his top and they headed off to play their game. And I decided I would join them on the side of the pitch, socially distanced, of course, very safely with the other parents. About 10 minutes into the game, um, the sun came out and it was like super bright. Um, so bright that I was having to crunch my eyes up, you know, when it's so sunny like that. And I thought, I'm going to end up with a really sore headache. And I was also struggling to follow what was happening in the game and who was who and who was in what team and who was scoring and who wasn't. So I ran back to the car and I remembered that I had put in a pair of sunglasses. So I popped on my sunglasses, ran back to the side of the pitch. But then I had another problem. My headache went away, but because I was wearing really, really dark glasses, the two teams, the red and blue team and the black and blue team, their shirts all look the same behind my really dark glasses. And so although I could see the game and I could see that the boys were playing rugby, I couldn't see the important stuff. I couldn't see who was in which game who was scoring, who wasn't, and I couldn't find Daniel at all. And I suppose it made me think that my dark glasses are a bit like sin. You know, when you're not living the way that, that Jesus wants you to, and we're maybe making choices and doing things and saying things and thinking things that actually we know aren't right. Like maybe only seeing what's right in front of us, like I could with the sunglasses on. Um, when we look at people or situations and we make decisions about them just by what we can see right in front of us, by how they look, by maybe what clothes they're wearing, maybe what car they drive, grown-ups might do that, what house they live, where they live, things like that. Um, and do you know what? That's not right. We don't see the important stuff. We don't see things like, are they kind inside? Are they a really good friend to someone? Are they, um, are they good and have a godly heart? We miss all those things. And you know what? It's really important that we see things through God's eyes and we take off our sunglasses and we get to see the important stuff. We get to see um, all the good stuff that's inside and we get to see people's heart. And you know, he told a story, there was a story in 1 Samuel um, about a time when God had sent Samuel out, Samuel out to anoint a new king. Now, unfortunately, Samuel had chosen a king previously, Saul, and he'd done it with his sunglasses on. So he hadn't seen the important stuff. And so God had sent Samuel out and Samuel went and he met um, some of Jesse's sons. And one of Jesse's sons was like a super strong, tall, he looked just fabulous and he looked like real king material. But God reminded Samuel in verse 7 that actually that's not what we should do when we are looking at people. And the verse goes like this. God said to Samuel, don't look at his appearance or at his height of his stature because I have rejected him. God had said, no, this is not who I want to be king. For God sees not as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but Lord the Lord looks at the heart. And so 
I want you to remember in situations and when you're looking at people that actually we need to see the important stuff. We need to take off our sunglasses and see the important stuff like God sees it. All right, take care everyone and we're going to enjoy one of our new children's songs now. You are the only answer to the situation that we have got ourselves into. So Heavenly Father, won't you please come down and give us a helping hand because we need you right now. I pray for those who feel forgotten about, who feel isolated, who feel alone. I pray that they would hear the chat of a friendly neighbour at their door. I pray for those around us dealing with long-term illness to feel right now in this moment, in this next hour, a sense of relief from pain. I pray for all those mums and dads, all the single parent families, have faith in yourself. You are doing a fantastic job through these difficult times. Your children love you. I pray for the couples who didn't make it, who have split up and find themselves lost feeling like failures. I pray you would speak to them, sending them words of hope. I pray for those around us who are unemployed, trying to apply for jobs, trying to apply for benefits, whilst having no access to technology. I pray that your Holy Spirit would guide them to open doors. I pray for those who are struggling with addiction, but they find the courage from within to reach out and ask for help. I hope that their act of courage has not been in vain and someone answers them in their time of need. I pray for those who are living on the streets who go hungry, that they receive kindness in their plight. I pray that we continue to be blessed with street pastors. I pray the food banks remain open and the generosity of others keeps them stocked up. I pray for leaders of countries that you strive to communicate with honesty. I pray for leaders of support groups that they continue to inspire people. I pray for leaders of charities that their positive attitude brings funding. I pray for leaders of youth groups that their creativity encourages others to join in. I pray for leaders of the ACC that you please recognise how your hard work, your humour and your passion for speaking the gospel uplifts our spirits and, joy and brings us joy. I pray for those who feel insignificant, who feel they are not good enough. I pray that today God would open up their eyes, would hear his voice and they would feel in their heart his love. Everyone has a gift planted from God. You just have not recognised what that seed he planted in you is to be used for yet. I pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much, uh, Debbie, for chatting to our Lord on behalf of us all and reflecting your heart. Um, really, really nice. Um, we're going to go into another time of worship with a couple songs before uh, our Dawn comes to speak to us. So before we go into worship, <laughs> uh, I'm just going to pray for, for Dawn just now. Father, to, to second what Debbie says, we thank you for Dawn and our leadership team and those that are here and, and that join us that are willing to share their heart and speak uh, truth and, and your gospel to us. We pray that this morning our messages that we hear may be different. Our hearts are all different. Um, we're all at different stages. And, but we know that there's truth today to hear. We know that there's truth that we can grab onto today, whether it be the same for some of us or different. We know that you've got things to say to us this morning. And when we hear your truth, we want to know you more. We come closer to you. And in doing that, we become more like you. 
And that's what we want this morning. Amen. So we thank you for Don um, and me. His, his words and your words this morning um, just, just change a bit in us. Amen. Well, again, um, great to see you this morning. I want to thank Debbie for sharing an inspiring prayer with us. Um, that was marvelous. And uh, thank you for covering all the bases in that prayer, Debbie. Uh, and also for um, uh, Lindsay. Uh, we're so relieved, Lindsay. Um, we were all sitting here thinking, oh my goodness, Lindsay has got two black eyes. That's why she's wearing uh, sunglasses. We were so relieved when you took your sunglasses off to show your lovely face that it wasn't the case. Um, but thank you for your efforts for our, our children's talk. So um, over this month of um, November, or sorry, September, not quite in November yet, we are um, looking at a series called Mission Critical. So that should be up on your screen. There we are. Uh, and what we mean by Mission Critical is um, getting back to almost like doing a reset to try to understand what does it mean for us to live according to the mission of Jesus. We've called it the manifesto of Jesus. Um, so we're not just looking back at what did Jesus do, what was his mission, but we want to relearn and recalibrate, if you want, our lives and our life as a church, even in these critical times that we're living, living with the manifesto and the mission of Jesus. So we started this a few weeks ago, and um, the mission of Jesus is recorded in Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, where Jesus, quoting Isaiah 61, says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to do four things, to proclaim good news to the poor. We covered that a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the words in the original literally say, to evangelize the poor, to bring good news to those who are in the deepest need of hope and forgiveness and life, um, and that's who Jesus came to reach. Last week, we took the second part of that to proclaim freedom, freedom for the prisoners, and, and Sarah Kennedy, who's a member of our church who works in one of the local prisons in Glasgow, was able to share some practical examples from her experience of what it means to help people find freedom today, freedom for people who are literally prisoners. Number three today, recovery of sight for the blind. Interestingly, when you go back to Isaiah's original uh, version of this, Isaiah combines these two into one. He says, to release the prisoners from darkness. And it's interesting, we won't have time to go through all of the references, obviously, this morning. But many times in the New Testament, when they talk about blindness and they talk about recovery of sight, they also talk about people who are in bondage, people who are imprisoned. And there's a connection between what people can see and what people experience in their lives. Sometimes the blindness uh, that people experience in their lives leads to um, them becoming prisoners to uh, many of the things that Debbie mentioned in her prayer this morning. Uh, for example, addiction can be one of those. And then next week, we're going to look at the fourth and final one to set the oppressed free. Recovery of sight for the blind. Um, I think there's an obvious connection between these five pictures. They're all um, inspiring people who, despite the blindness that they've experienced in life, have gone on to create some of the most amazing music and songs. Now, I'm not going to throw this as a quiz because Debbie Fanning knows everything about music, and she's here this morning, so she will get all of these people. There's one I don't think she knows, so I'm going to go through them anyway. On the top right here, we have... Um, who do we have, Debbie? This one up here. <laughs> you know who he is? Okay, we'll start with Ray Charles in the top left, and then we'll come. Ray Charles, famous uh, soul singer um, and musician, keyboard player. And in the middle, we have Stevie Wonder, probably the most famous blind musician probably of all time, who has inspired so many people. On the bottom left, we have Jeff Healy. Jeff Healy is a Canadian guitarist. Uh, he passed away um, during the time when we lived in Canada. He was from Toronto. He was an amazing guitarist. And Jeff Healy 
contracted cancer at birth in his eyes when he was a baby. And they had to remove his eyes as a baby when he was born and lived his whole life blind and went on to make some of the, the greatest music that, that many have ever heard on a, on a guitar. He didn't hold the guitar. He would put the guitar out in front of him and play it uh, like that. On the bottom right, we have the five blind boys of Alabama, um, all five blind singers who've all gone on to create amazing music. And of course, who's the other one? Andrea Bocelli. All right, I know you could, Andrea Bocelli, then crazy, amazing tenor. All of these are people that, despite their disability, have gone on to do great things. Now, um, we weren't here last week. We got a week off. We were away on the east coast of Scotland um, in Ely. And one of the things that Kirsten and I did when we were away was we were asked to catch, catch up on a few movies. And we came across one that has just been released on Netflix uh, about a month ago. And it's called Rising Phoenix. It is so inspiring. So if you want something to do during this time, if you're looking for something good to watch, watch this film. It's a, a kind of a documentary, but, um, and it's, it's based on the Paralympic Games. And it goes right back and it introduces us to really the daughter of the man, because he's passed away, who started the equivalent of the Paralympic Games. He was a German doctor during World War II. He was Jewish and he managed to get out of Germany and he came to England. And he treated people of blindness, but other ailments as well. But he believed that their disabilities should not restrict people from doing things that, if you want, normal people can do. So he organized physical activities and sports and games for them. And this caught on. And now we have the Paralympic Games. Last time it was in Rio. So I just want to show you a very brief clip for just under two minutes from the Rio Games. And this is so inspiring of what blind athletes can actually achieve. Let's watch this. The stuff that you'll actually see uh, in that film, it's so inspiring. Um, and it, uh, as I watched it this week, uh, I didn't actually watch it because I knew I was going to give this message. But I was just watching it and thinking, that ties in so well with what we want to say today about how Jesus can give recovery of sight to the blind. You saw a practical example there of what probably people who are blind thought they would never be able to do, to actually run in a straight line in an Olympics and actually win a medal. But they could only do it with the help of another person. And I don't know if you caught it in that, but um, there's a, a very important rule in, in this particular uh, event the, the, actually, the blind athlete must cross the line first so they can be helped the whole way to the finish line. But at that final moment, the, the, the runner who's supporting them, who's attached to them, has to draw back and they must cross the line first or they will be disqualified. And again, showing what can happen with a little help from our friends. In the Bible, uh, right from the very beginning, God is passionately concerned that people see. In Genesis 1, the, the opening words of the entire Bible, this is what we read. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, and darkness, just notice that phrase, darkness was over the surface of the deep. So when our world began, when our planet began four billion years ago, there was no light. There was only darkness, no light. And because there was no light, there was no life on our planet at all. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. It took clever people thousands of years to eventually discover what scientifically that was. But right there in the very first verses in the Bible written thousands of years ago, God told us. God told us what had happened. There was light. Our life, our world, uh, everything that we exist and experience now began with God giving permission 
for light to come into our world and darkness to be dispelled. Right through the Old Testament, people experience this darkness in their lives. There's one psalm I was reading this week, Psalm 107. And in Psalm 107, the, the psalmist is giving a list of, of people whose lives have been changed. And he starts with these words, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. So that's the, the, the main phrase he wants him to capture. How do we know that God is good? How do we know that God's love endures? Because God redeems people. He changes people. He changes their lives. And he goes on to say, if you're one of those people, if you're one of those redeemed people, then tell your story. Those who've been, who, who, whom God has redeemed, those whom he's gathered together, and then one of the groups of people are people who were in darkness. He said, some sat in darkness, in utter darkness, prisoners suffering in iron chains. And again, notice the link between darkness and blindness and prisons. They cried to the Lord in their trouble. He saved them in their distress. He brought them out of the darkness, the utter darkness, and broke away their chains. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. In the prophets in Isaiah, this is a passage that we always read at Christmas time. This is the passage that goes on to talk about how unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. One of the Christmas passages that we read at Advent. But just before that part, talking about the one who was going to be born one day, this is what Isaiah says. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. Those living in the land of darkness, a light has dawned. And Isaiah was talking to people in his day, obviously, who, who were living in darkness and looking for the light. And when they start to see that light, they walk towards it. They go towards the light and they leave the darkness. We know now what Isaiah was talking about. Isaiah, uh, as a prophet, was looking down through the ages. And he wasn't just looking to his own time. He was looking to a time when God would set this whole world free from its darkness and bring the light into the worlds. And we know now um, that that was talking about Jesus. In John chapter 1, this is a great passage um, that focuses on the light and who Jesus was. John says, in him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. In other words, John is saying, Jesus came into our world to bring us life. Life in all its fullness. The kind of life that only God can give us. And how does he do that? He comes, first of all, as the light. God turns on the light, and the light exposes the darkness. It exposes the darkness in us. But God doesn't expose that darkness because he wants us to stay in it. He exposes the darkness. He shines in the darkness so that he can dispel the darkness and get rid of the darkness whether that is in a literal or a physical or metaphorical sense. And he says, when the light shines, the darkness can't overcome it. In another translation, it says, the darkness cannot withstand it. When light shines, darkness must go. There was a man sent from God. His name was John. Talking about John the Baptist, he came for what reason? To testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He, John, was not the light. He only came as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. And that's ultimately why Jesus came. So in his manifesto, when Jesus spoke about recovering sight and giving sight back to the blind, he's getting to the heart of why he came into our world. He came into our world not just to heal blind people, and we'll look at a few examples in a moment of how he did that, but to give everyone, John says, light, to enlighten all of us. You know, when you're physically blind like Bocelli or Stevie Wonder or Jeff Healy or, the, or these people, you have a, a, a real sense of what it is not to be able to see and to do the things which many people can do. And we take our sight for granted, don't we? The things that we do simply because we can see, we never think about that. 
And, and, and yet many times in the Gospels when Jesus was here, it was people with disability. It was people who were blind. It was people who couldn't walk. It was people who had contracted leprosy. It was people who had these disabilities who were attracted to Jesus. Why? Because they were most aware that they needed him. Because of their physical disabilities, they knew that they needed Jesus for life. When Jesus was born, two old men got to say something and pronounce something about him. One was Zechariah, and he says, The rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the path of peace. He's talking about Jesus. And then there was another old man called Simeon who literally took the baby Jesus in his arms. And he says, my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. These two old men got a glimpse of what this one, this baby who came into the world was going to do. He was going to open people's eyes. And that's what Jesus did. In the gospel, several times it gives us a, a description of the kinds of people who came to Jesus. And in some of those descriptions, it includes people who were blind. Here's one example from Matthew 15. Great crowds to him, bringing the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others, and laid them at his feet, and he healed them. People were amazed when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled made well, the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they praised the God of Israel. Jesus loved all people. He came to reach out to all people, but it was those many times, as I've said, with disabilities who got to see and understand him, and he healed the blinds. John the Baptist that we've just read about, who came to testify about Jesus, eventually ended up in prison, and he lost. He was going to lose his life. And John, when he was in prison, he went through a period of doubt. And he sent two of his, his friends to the disciples of Jesus to say, it's like, is Jesus really the one? Is he the one that I was talking about? Is he the Messiah? Is he the one that, that we were hoping... John, this amazing man, Jesus said about John the Baptist, there was no one born of a woman greater than John the Baptist. That's how great this man was. And yet he went through a period of doubt where he questioned, was Jesus truly the Messiah, the Savior of the world, the Son of God? And this is what Jesus said to John's friends. Jesus said to them, go back and tell John what you hear and what you see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, <clears throat> and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. All the different aspects of his mission. And so he's basically saying, go back and tell John, look at what's happening, John. Okay, you're in prison, you don't get to see this anymore, but blind people are seeing People who couldn't walk are walking. People who couldn't hear are hearing. People who are excluded from society because of their leprosy are clean. Dead people have got their lives back, and people are hearing good news. In the Gospels, the Gospel writers record five different times, five specific people, or sometimes groups of people, who actually got to encounter Jesus, people who were blind. The first one we read is in Matthew 12. I'm not going to read all the details, but I do want to summarize some of these. It says, they brought to him a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute, and Jesus healed him. So this man's blindness and his inability to speak was associated with an evil power that was controlling his life. It wasn't just a natural phenomenon. It wasn't that the man had an accident when he was a baby or some illness had come on him. There was something demonic. There was something evil in this man's life that was actually inhibiting him and pro prohibiting him from seeing and speaking. So get this. The guy can't see 
and the guy can't speak. He can't communicate. So they bring him to Jesus. We don't know how Jesus healed him. We're not given the description, but we're simply told that Jesus healed him. He opened his eyes so he could see life, and he enabled him to speak so that he could tell of the wonders of God's. That was the first one. In Matthew 9, there's another example. Uh, this time it's two men. And these two men are following Jesus. So they're blind, maybe like the people in the, in, the, in the video that you say, they're maybe helping one another. They're both blind. And they're following the disciples and following Jesus. And they're calling. Maybe they're in the back. And imagine that Jesus is going and he's preaching and ministering to people. The disciples are with him. And in the background are these two blind guys. And they're calling out, have mercy on us, son of David. This says Jesus stopped, he turned to them, he touched their eyes, and their sight was restored. Another example is of a man who was brought to Jesus. This man wasn't following, so somebody got him and brought him to Jesus and begged Jesus to touch him. So maybe they had heard or maybe they'd seen what Jesus had done for these two blind guys, by touching their eyes, he'd healed them. He said, well, maybe he can do it for my friend. So he went and got his friend, and he brought his blind friend and begged Jesus to do the same for his friend that he'd done for the other two men. And it says Jesus did something quite strange, a bit weird, really. It says he spat, spat on his hand, and he touched the man's eyes with what he had spat on his hands. And then Jesus says to him, can you see? And the guy says, I can kind of see. I can kind of see people, but they look like trees. So he couldn't quite see. And then it says, Jesus placed his hands on the man's eyes a second time, and then his eyes were opened and his sight was restored. So it was a partial healing that led to a full healing. Um, again, we don't know why that happened. And then another example is a man called Bartimaeus. He's one of the most famous ones recorded in the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all talk about this guy, a blind man called Bartimaeus. This was near the end of Jesus' life when he's going up to Jerusalem, nearing the final week of his life. This man, Bartimaeus, is sitting by the roadside begging. And in the times of, of Jesus and the, and the New Testament, people who were blind had no social security, there weren't any social workers who were going to come and help them. There were no benefits that they would get. Um, if, if it wasn't for friends, they were going to beg for their whole lives to survive. He too begins to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And then Jesus asks him an unusual question. He goes to a blind man sitting by the side of the road called Bartimaeus, and he says, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? Why did he do that? It's like everyone could see what Bartimaeus wanted. They could see what he needed, okay? He clearly wanted to see, but Jesus wanted him to speak. And in speaking, he says, Rabbi. And in, a, in another uh, translation, in Matthew's gospel, he calls him Lord. So he uses God's name for Jesus. He says, Rabbi, teacher, I want to see. And in those words of speaking what he wanted, Jesus could see the faith in Bartimaeus because Jesus then goes on to heal him, give him his sight back, and he says to Bartimaeus, your faith has healed you. And when we speak out those words, when Jesus said to us, says to us, what do you want? When we say to him, this is what I want, Lord. This is what I want. This is what I need. We're speaking out words coming from our faith. And Bartimaeus that day was wonderfully healed. And the story goes on at the end. There's this, there's this little phrase at the end. Bartimaeus followed Jesus from a distance and talked to people, tell people what he did. There's one final example. I encourage you to read this at home. Please read it at home today because it's a whole chapter. Uh, and I'm clearly not going to do that. A man who was born blind from birth. But the, I just really want to fix one phrase in this as we draw our message to a close today. In the passage in John 9, where Jesus heals a man who was blind from birth, Jesus uses this phrase. 
He says, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. That's why Jesus opened people's eyes. That's why Jesus healed blind people. Um, because he came to bring light into the world. While I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. In this chapter, the man is healed. The Pharisees, the religious leaders then come, and they interrogate this guy. They speak to him. They bring in his parents. They interrogate them. And then they interrogate this guy at the end. And, and they, they keep asking him, how did this happen? How could this person do this? And basically the guy says, I don't know. Go and ask him for yourself. And they, 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 they hurl abuse at the man. But in this chapter, we see a contrast between people of faith who trust Jesus, who believe Jesus can change their lives, and people who don't have that faith, people who can't understand who Jesus is, the blinds. And there are people in Jesus' day, and there's people in our day who can see with their eyes but they can't see. It's a little bit what like Lindsay was talking about earlier. We can see humanly. We can see from the outward perspective, but there's things that we can't see, but we don't know that we can't see them. We judge people by outward appearance. We make decisions based upon what we can see, but we can't see things as God wants us to see. And Jesus said people like that, religious people, are basically blind guides. Jesus was ruthless, absolutely ruthless, with religious people who thought they could see who were actually blind. And in Matthew's gospel, five times, he says, you are just blind guides leading the blind. And so, as we conclude today, let me give you a few takeaways that you can take into this week in your job in your life, with your family, with neighbors and friends, three ways I think we can make a difference this week. Because Jesus said, while he was in the world, he was the light of the world. But you know, today, as followers of Jesus, we are the light of the world. That's what he said in Matthew chapter 5. In Matthew chapter 5, he called all of his followers the light of the world. In this chapter, the religious leaders come to the man. And they say these words, what have you got to say about him? It was your eyes he opens. And I want to ask all of you today, whether you're listening online or here, if I was to ask that of you today, you don't need to shout it out, but I want you to think about it today. What have you got to say about Jesus? It was your eyes he opened. However he did that, whether you were a child, a teenager, you came to faith later in life, whether you're one of the members of our church who's come to faith in the last number of years, who've come from another culture, another country, I want to again ask you again today. Someone said to you, what have you got to say about Jesus? It was your eyes he opened. There are three ways we can be a light to the world. First of all, we can be a lighthouse. This past week when we were through in the East Coast, we saw lots of lighthouses. And lighthouses are there to shine. And in a general sense, we can all shine. We can show a light. Jesus said in Matthew 5, don't hide your light. Don't hide the light that's within you under a bushel. Shine. Why? So that people will see your Father in heaven. It might be an act of kindness you get to do this week. Debbie has been mentioning in her prayer various practical things. It might be a phone call. It might be chapping someone's door. It might be grabbing a bag of food and taking it to someone. It might be someone in your work. You, as a Christian, have the light within you. You can hide that light or you can let it out and let it shine through your acts of kindness this week. When you show an act of kindness, remember you're being a lighthouse. Secondly, you can be a guide dog this week. We saw some people, didn't we, in the video, who were literally hooked up to people who couldn't see. You have an opportunity, we all have opportunities this week, to actually come alongside people, to come close to people, and to be a guide for them. Again, that could be something practical, something that somebody can't do for themselves, that you can go and do for them, or maybe even do with them as you're able to. In Romans 2, it talks about being a guide for the blind. 
But finally today, we can all be optometrists. Optometrists, people whose gift and calling in life is to help people to see. One of the greatest ways we can do that is to actually lead someone to Jesus. I've had the opportunity many times in my life of, of doing that, and every time I do, I'm so grateful. And I know I've gone over my time, but I have to finish with this story today. This story can't be left aside, so bear with me. When we lived in York, we lived near the University of York. And our, our house, there was a little lane up the side of our house. And all the university students used to walk across from the university. And those who lived near our house would walk down this lane. So we would see them every day, university students walking down the lane beside our house. And one day, early on in our time there, we saw this quite stunning young man who was clearly from Pakistan or India, one of these uh, Eastern countries, long, long flowing, long black hair right down his back. And he was blind and he had a guide dog. And we used to see this guy uh, who was blind with the guide dog walking past our house, walking down the lane. And he was a striking, striking guy. And then one Sunday morning, the guy showed up at our church with his dog. And he walked into the church, and he sat down on a chair, and the dog got under the chair, and he sat in church. And he was in church, and we go, that's that guy. <laughs> it's the guy with the long black hair who's blind. And he'd become a Christian. He was from a Muslim background originally in Pakistan. He'd come over here with his family. Uh, he would developed this blindness and couldn't see. And his name was Tosif. And we got to talk to him, and he became our close friend. And eventually, I ended up conducting his wedding. He got married to a, a girl who came to our church, and I did his wedding before we left York. We often said, like, Tosif, how, how did all this happen? Why did you become a Christian? He said, Don, I've been searching for God my whole life. And I, 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 my blindness got worse and worse and worse. When I came to York, the people who befriended me were all Christians. They shone a light. They showed kindness to me. They became my friends. They helped me with my courses. They would read to me. They would speak to me. They would literally take me out with them. They befriended me. And I thought, why are these Christians doing this for me? I don't have their religion. I'm a completely different religion. And he said, so I started asking questions, and they started talking about Jesus. They said, I, I had never read the Bible. I'd never heard this. So I, what, they, what I asked them to do was to read the Bible to me, because I couldn't see it. And he said, I used to listen to them reading the Bible to me. And then they would give me tapes, and I would listen to these tapes. And he says, God opened my eyes, and now I can see, but I can't see. But he says, I can see in all kinds of ways. And that was an amazing experience for us to actually see someone who was physically blind come to see Jesus. We have all kinds of opportunities this week to go and make a difference in our world. Act of kindness, shine your light. Find specific people and hook yourself up to them and do something to let these people show that there's a God who loves them. And maybe, just maybe, you'll get an opportunity to share the message of of, of the one who came into our world to open people's eyes, help them to see. Lord, as we conclude our service now and this time together, help us this week to go and make a difference. And may we all at some stage in our life have the great, great privilege, the greatest privilege that you can give any of us of leading somebody else to Jesus, the light of the world. Amen. Are we okay? There we go. Well, <laughs> as if I'm not loud enough. Um, oh, I love that song so much. Um, His mercies are new every day. Oh, just, just love it. It makes me so, so happy and just, just full of life. But um, folks, thank you so much for, for joining this morning and, and for being here today. Hopefully we'll see more of you um, in the coming weeks or so, which would be uh, absolutely amazing. 
Don, thank you so much for encouraging us this morning. Debbie, thank you for your amazing prayer. Um, and Lindsay, wherever you are, don't know if I can see your, your coupon. I can't. But uh, thank you so much. Uh, and especially the guys uh, up the back. We've got Kemp and Timothy. So for making this happen, letting us be here and doing all the technical stuff for us so we don't have to. Uh, thank you so much. But um, again, thanks for being here. I hope you have a wonderful Sunday. An incredible week. We're just going to play out uh, our service with a song that fits in really nicely with what Don was saying today. So I encourage you to stay um, if you can. Um, if, you, if not, then again, have a great day. We'll see you soon. <laughs> um, so, uh, yes, yeah, um, I can't even speak anymore. But <laughs> we'll leave it at that, but stick around if you can. Um, and we'll see you all very soon. We love you all. Um, and it's great to, to, to be here together. So, uh, again, love you. Have a great day. I've stopped talking. Bye. <laughs>